Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the first day of, of our symposium of hunters and gatherers. We would like to deliver our thanks for your kind coordination and registering at our bit.ly links. And thank you for also being very much on time. My name is Christine. I'm hosting from Selasar Scenario Art Space. Before we open up the symposium, please note down the several housekeeping points. This is a safe space for everyone. Kindly respect and nurture the space for anyone who's joining. Please turn off your audio input at all time. And we also have the Q&A session at four. Uh, and please leave your questions and inquiries during the sessions only at the Q&A box, or maybe you can also drop down at the chat box. We will also be recorded and broadcasted online through YouTube. Uh, please make sure you check out any other further details on our link three slash coordination three. Uh, thank you for joining. I will leave the openings to Kitima. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second day of uh, the Scatterer Symposium. My name is Kitima Zarikosit. I'm a co-curator of this pollination tree project entitled Of Hunter and Gatherer. Today, we here on the second day with the title Extraction, Resilient, Admit, and Environmental in Entropy. The second day will focus on the issue of environmental agency and door in different contexts surrounding the issue of social shame and eco economic development, which has led to extraction as both survival and exploitation. Uh, we are here today with our speaker, for speaker today with us, Pilatania. Elizabeth D. Indinas, uh, Uchalanan, Sutirat Sutabrinya, and all this presentation will be responded by Apung Hajar Terenong. Um, so I will start leave these panelists to start their presentation. It will start with Elizabeth. Please continue, Elizabeth. Thank you. If well, Elizabeth, please turn on the microphone. Yes, so good afternoon, everyone. So I will show you my presentation, mainly with pictures. So this. And view. Oh no, full screen, sorry. The full screen, okay. So, uh, Back to the first one. So the soft skills of mask facing environmental brutality. So also those masks are done out of used cardboard or dry pumpkins. They are very powerful. And their story starts here. Uh, this is in Sumatra Island on a site called Muarajambi, which used to be from the 7th century to the 13th or 14th century, the largest uh, Buddhist uh, university of Southeast Asia. Um, it was on the crossroad of the sea roads, sea routes, which uh, took over the, the silk uh, road uh, by the 7th century. And, and uh, so many, uh, Chinese monks and scholars came from China uh, through the Malacca Strait to study. The most famous one is uh, Yi Qing. Uh, in the seventh century, he wrote many accounts. And there were also from India people coming. And the one, the most famous of, of them is called Atisha, 11th century. He went at the end, after 12 years studying in Muarajambi to Tibet, that's why you have his life uh, designed, painted on a mural in Drepung Monastery in Tibet. And what you see is his arrival in Sumatra by boat. So they were going through the Malacca Strait, entering and going upstream to uh, on the Batanghari River, which is the largest river in Sumatra. And uh, so this is now how they rebuilt part of it. And so you see, so the, 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 because Aftisha after that went to Tibet to reform Buddhism, 
he had, we, you can, we can say that the uh, uh, fame and teaching of this huge university is still alive in the Tibetan Buddhist teaching. And it's still acknowledged by all the Tibetan lineages. But in the 13th or 14th century, for unknown reason until now, this site uh, became totally forgotten and abandoned, and it became covered in ruins and covered by the, by the jungle. And now, nowadays, uh, on the bank of the river lives uh, people in, a, in wood house, you know, on tiles, and they are all Muslims. So this is their tradition. And uh, in uh, uh, 2012, the site was inscribed by the Indonesian government as a heritage cultural site. And also in 2009 by the UNESCO as a candidate for uh, world heritage. But it doesn't protect the site. The site has many, many uh, environmental problem just to uh, to uh, talk about two the main ones so this map based on google earth was made by the young villagers uh, so you see the the pink spots are the stockpile coal on the river because there are many minings in sumatra and they bring the coal on the uh, river to carry it then on barge to uh, to the Malacca Strait and then to Singapore to export it to the to the world all over the world and the white spots are the palm oil plantation on the heritage site itself yeah and uh, this brings a lot of environment and health problems because when the coal is uh, embarked on the big barge it makes a lot of dust and poisonous uh, rain, acid rain. And because it's just across the village, the villagers have really suffer from the dust. And of course the palm oil uh, plantation, as you know, uh, bring deforestation, but they also um, uh, have another consequence for the village because uh, they, they are planted also on swamps and on, on those swamps, uh, that's where the people collected the pandan leaves and the women make a uh, tikar, you know, nuts, very traditional nuts, very important for the life, daily life of the people and very symbolic. So if the pandan leaves disappear, the nuts tradition also disappeared. Uh, so when I met, I came first to the village 10 years ago or more, uh, the young villagers were really fighting against those uh, uh, environmental problems, but with a very angry way. You know, they were, we can say, marginal people, and they were marginalized also by the local government, who said that they are robbers and outlaws, you know, just because they were protesting. Yeah. But they didn't know the right way how to, 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 to make uh, themselves heard. So they decided, because they had like a stigma of being outlaws and, and, and marginal people, they decided to build a foundation called Ruma Menapo. This is what we are now building in the coming months. It's called Pondok or Ruma Menapo. And to investigate about their own history and culture, to know more yeah, what happened. And that's how they found out by us talking with their grandparents that their ancestors, Maybe, maybe two centuries ago, they were lepers, lepers, and they have been dropped on this site, which was at the time a jungle with rains. Yeah, and uh, the local, the surrounding villages will drop the lepers in this site. Can you imagine the center of the biggest center of Buddhist knowledge of Southeast Asia became a a, a, a drop place? for lepers people, yeah. And so this was a big discovery for them. And they heard also that by the time of the, uh, the end of the fasting months of Maramadan, they have a procession, it's called Takbiran all over Indonesia. And at that time, the lepers could go out of the forest, they will making mask, they will make mask out of dried pumpkins and join the processions. And it, like they will cover the, the scores, you know? Of course, it was symbolic, but 
and the people will give them food in their bags in the, in the back. So the young people suddenly discovered that maybe their stigma was not so much that they were fi fighting against the corporation, but also because their ancestors were lepers and this story was never told. So they decided to uh, bring this mask again alive. So they dried uh, pumpkins and starting to create masks and reenact the story of the ancestors bound in the forest, like you can see on this picture. And they also reenact the last uh, night of the fasting months by doing this procession going from house to houses. And this uh, mask tradition uh, developed more and more. In uh, 2009, uh, as you know, maybe there were very huge fires in Sumatra and Kalimantan and in Muara Jambi, it was very, it was terrible. I was there at the time. In the day, the sky was orange. We couldn't see the sun. In the night, we couldn't, couldn't breathe. So uh, the people of the village, again, they were very creative. So of course, the forests were burned because of palm oil plantation. And instead of becoming angry and so on, they turn again to the mask of the ancestors and to uh, the, their culture. And they uh, revived the tradition, uh, which is like an offering on the Batanghari, which is called, uh, what is this called? I forgot, it's called Larun uh, Sunges. Uh, it means to go to, to make offering to the river, yeah. And you see the people who are wearing a mask on the boat, it's not because of the COVID pandemic, it was before. So you can imagine the situation. And uh, so they were very smart to transform the, the leper uh, pumpkin mask into a fire mask. Yeah. Uh, so this is their creativity again to respond to the problem of environment. Um, and uh, this gave them a lot of uh, courage and confidence to uh, develop more and more the arts. And they started to organize the artist residence. So I organized it with them and with Harry Dono, you might know it was one of the most famous painter in Indonesia and he's a good friend. And with the La Salle uh, College of Art from Singapore, they came and made a residence there. And the students were so impressed by these young people, so creative. and you know, not like an ego trip, but a collective creativity. So this was, they spent a week doing a, a workshop together. But the beauty of it is that the uh, villagers, young villagers artists were then six months later invited for a common exhibition in La Salle College in Singapore. You see, they, they exhibit their house in the, on the campus of uh, La Salle College in Singapore, which, which is so modern. And they also perform, perform uh, a poem that Borju, you see the one who is paint golden on this picture. Borju is the, the leader of the group. He wrote a beautiful poem called Disaster on the Land of Melayu. And the gold paint uh, symbolized the, 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 the golden past of uh, Sumatra and Muara Jambi at the time when uh, Sumatra was called in Sanskrit uh, Survanat Vapi, so it means the the golden island and because it was full of gold and that's why how buddhist it was not the silk road road but the gold road yeah and the black of course paint uh, represent the nowadays disasters of coal and and fire and smoke and smoke and we also together yeah made a book publish a book in four languages so i might take uh, longer about this book later in our discussion and uh, the, we took the cover by, from a painting, mural painting made on the river by all the artists. And this, is, this one is from, Muara, uh, from Heridono. And another famous artist from uh, Indonesia came also to make a residency, Bambang Asrini Wijanarko. He made this beautiful uh, uh, installation together with the villages. This is made out of, of, uh, of a special uh, uh, plants that you find in Muara Jambi in abundance, it's wild. And he also bring with him a choreographer and this choreographer uh, uh, build up a group of young women of the village and they decided to create a dance who is also reenacting a contemporary dance, reenacting 
the traumatic past of the ancestors and lepers. And that is very interesting because until then, the young women in the village were not really involved in the art scene. And suddenly they became the avant-garde of the art scene in the village with this dance, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and what is very interesting with this mask is how, of course, the environmental problem are still there. They are not solved, but at least there is a dialogue and the Muarajambi people now, especially the young generation, are recognized by the local government, by the uh, Ministry of Art and Education uh, as really uh, important actors of the, of the site, guardian of the site, and they get orders, official orders, to make more movies uh, about their own culture and also the culture of the surrounding villages. And all is this because they reconnect it with the traumatic uh, time past of the ancestors as lepers, and they were able to transform it into an artistic uh, community project, which is still now developing more and more. So this is my presentation. I don't know if I still have time, but well, this is it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We come back to you after in the Q&A session and uh, on the reflection. So um, next, I would like to invite Wood to share his presentation. Wood, please. Hello. Um, one moment, I have to share my screen. Okay, hello everyone. So I would like to introduce you to um, the construction of the series of dams on the lower part of the Mekong River. So first of all, I would like to introduce the picture of uh, this is called the river mark. It's all along the lower Mekong River. It was built by French during their colonized between 1880 uh, to uh, 1896 before uh, the break of the World War I. So, this represents uh, the foreign influence on this liver that can date back to those era, the colonial era that French want to find the waterway to connect uh, the Indo China Sea to the uh, South China through this liver. But they cannot do it do because of uh, the lapis and the lock uh, formation of the liver prevent them from doing that. And then in 1950, the U.S. tried to build the dam on the, uh, on the, on the river. But then the war and the lack of uh, need of electricity prevent them from doing the dam. Until 1995, that was the first dam was built up north in China. And then many of you might not know this. Uh, on the lower part, the name of the river is Mekong. But on the China, the northern part of the Mekong, the name of the river is uh, Lan Chang. Anyway, this is uh, the dam in 2019, already full. Uh, as you can see that the, the river that used to be muddy now is very clear and calm. At this point, uh, I went there in 2018, just one year before it's finished. And this is the picture a year after, just a few months before the grand opening of the dam. I, 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 uh, I choose to go in this period because I want to really find the dialogue between the landscape, the dam structure, and the neighborhood, the people who live inside Yaburi and the town along the river. As you can see, this is inside the dam, the, inside the construction site. This is the, uh, the, the pot that they're gonna put the generator in. During this construction, uh, the Sayaburi Dam will produce around 1,100 megawatt uh, of electricity. Interestingly, over 95% 90, of that will be export back to Thailand. So this, also show another layer of uh, 
transboundary problem here is almost like the modern modern colonialism of the country, where the foreign company go invest on this kind of structure and then extract all the resource to export back for somewhere that's need. But then it's create the question: what's left for the people who who live there and who work there? So I start with this is uh, the quality. Actually, this is the only thing that make in Laos for building this dam. And what I see here is um, it's like you move the mountain from the mountain side to build another mountain in the middle of the Mekong River. As you, as you can see during my, uh, in my installation, I uh, separate things into three layer, the landscape, which is represented by those lock. And then this is the video installation uh, of uh, many part of the dam, which is speak to each other, like the moving of the least uh, between uh, the nature and the man-made structure. And this is also represents the transfer of the products of this dam back to Thailand again. This is the dialog part of the, of the nature of the landscape and the man-made structure. In the second part, I represent uh, the change in societies around the dam by the housings, the housing unit that I uh, divided into three parts, the worker camp, um, the relocation villager that I have to move because of uh, the flood and construction of this structure. And then the last part is uh, the town of Sayaburi. The first part here, which is show is um, the worker camp in uh, the construction site. As you can see on the light, it's already, uh, they are already taking it down because this was took uh, at almost the end of the construction project. For, to give you the number, the size of this, pro, uh, of this uh, construction site, during the peak of construction, there was uh, 11,000 people working on this site compared to around 16,000 people of Sayaburi. As you can see, that is almost as big as a, this construction site is a city on its own. But once it's finished, everything will be removed and it will be gone. And here, the uh, relocating village that the, the governments move uh, the village from the mountain along the river to live together inside. Every house is look the same, but then it's not exactly the same because the surveys, uh, the condition of the villager house before they move in and they build the house according to the condition of their house. So some of the house will doesn't have uh, the ground floor. It will just have the, the hut with the wooden structure on top. What I want to show here is that even if the, every house is the same, the villager, they try to customize and try to make it personal as much as possible. And then the last part here is the town of Sayaburi. Some people also enjoy the booming economy here. As you can see, there are also a lot of uh, architecture element show here. That is also represents the influence from China and outsider where um, such for, uh, for example, those Loman Quorum on these colorful houses, um, which is not normal for Laos traditional house. And then this is also like the most simple way to show the wealth uh, of the, that they got from their booming economy. And also compare back to uh, the relocating uh, villager that's who seem like to suffer the most from this developing of uh, the dam that the, the way of life is totally changed. They no longer have access to the liver, to uh, gathering the fish and all the resource. The government was promised them uh, the land uh, to grow crop and then 
uh, every infrastructure like school, landing water. But then the biggest problem is like those land is not suitable for cultivation for growing rice. Many of them still have to go back to their own land to planting and then uh, bringing up food for their family. And this is to show another part of uh, what's going on inside the town of Sayaburi in the main market of the, of the city. You can also see there was a Chinese sign on top of this uh, big uh, market building to show uh, how much in front of Chinese inside this project, uh, inside, the, inside Laos, because I have to mention that Sayaburi Dam was uh, constructed by Thai company Shokan Chang. But, but then it's like the majority influence in Laos is from Thai and Chinese mostly. On the light, I show the villager in the Lee Settlement village that uh, I made some uh, family portrait for them um, during the, uh, the talk and research. Uh, many of them not even have the access to the photograph or documenting their family before. So I take this opportunity to make them uh, some uh, document uh, for them to remember or to see before things is further changed. And then I would like to wrap up uh, my presentation of this, uh, the empty land near uh, the construction sites of the dams. Further down, you can see the reservoir, and this is used to be the worker camp that uh, the company, when I went there and I have an interview with the project manager there, they said, when they finish, everything will be rebuilt and the plan every tree got documented before is cutting down and they prepare to plan exactly number of tree. So at the end, I would like to uh, conclude that uh, I don't know what gonna be, what gonna happen for the environment of Laos. There's certainly a change. And I would like to make people aware that there's something going on, on another country that we rarely have any idea what happened. And then there's a change going on that we should aware that this change is support our lifestyle, our comfortable life here that we enjoy. So there will be consequence and then something will be going on. This is on going project that I will follow the less of the dam in this uh, city does start to build up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wood. I think that uh, building dam in Lao is a sure like transboundary problem, and uh, even for us in Thailand as well. And of course, a lot of Chinese side everywhere in Thailand as well. Uh, next, I would like to invite another participant. Okay. Uh, Sutirat, do you mind going next? Thank you. Thank you, Kitima. Um, greeting to all the uh, organization and curators of the Gutterers, the online symposium uh, in Chiang Mai, um, Yogyakarta, and Saigon, and you know maybe in Singapore too, and the audience who, who take your time to listen. And participate. Uh, I would like to start to respond to the title, the, the 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 title of the talk today, and and of the work resilience. Of um, I think the resilience of the environment is possible under some certain conditions, such as we must always observe or evaluate ourselves, our environment, and if something is not right, we should be sensitive enough to react, discard, or change what we are doing. It's like living in a lab where the result we have found each time uh, being used as a base to decide what to do next. Uh, this state mostly allow us to do it in a small scale project, I believe. And, and today my presentation, my case study today, we focus on dike, weir or dam projects on the rivers. Um, 
the large scale electricity generation project that declined the environment and the value of what one wished to gain from the project mainly came from the less flexibility. Since we cannot forecast 100% of the future and therefore flexibility must be considered as part of the project. But for the large scale project, the error must be as small as possible also. Even though I have seen that the degenerated nature and environment can be restored. It takes time, but it's possible to restore. It depends how big is the problem. Um, this, from here, I will share screen. Um, so, um, the small scale flex and flexible method, in my opinion, surely impact the least. For example, the traditional dike made by rock or bamboo is easy to adjust and fix before the raining season arrives. It's compromised the living things who live in the rivers. And for example, this image is a tradition style uh, made by rock. Um, and so what uh, where Thailand is, what, what we produce or use for energy in Thailand. Actually, the hydropower is only 0.7% only, but it can impact a lot. Um, but uh, because when you, we think of the last scale project, it has enormous stage of the landscape it changed a lot of, of, uh, in, uh, of the landscape. And the gap of the time to repair it is also high if we destroy it already. Um, besides, in the case of the last hydroelectricity generation and mining project, the behavior of, of government to deal with the environment is quite opposite. And I don't see any large scale uh, project stop or destroy themselves when they found the big DSO echo by, by them. Uh, what I see is they built a much bigger one or shut up the one who criticized about that um, or just running the projects like nothing happened. Instead, those projects in a few decades or less is decline the ability to gain, to gain the profit. Um, for example, this one is a, a sample of the proposal of um, Mewong Dam uh, in Nakhon Sawan. And uh, the, the cost that need to pay for the, the dam is already, I'm uh, sorry, it's, it's not in English, but uh, the, the brew, the, the two brew is, um, is the cause of the construction. So, and the other is kind of the, the cause of what they need to, um, uh, restore the area uh, to maintain maintenance the area. So you can see that the money, a, a huge money that used as a budget for the dam is 80% um, is for only for construction. Um, and they believe is is will take uh, if you gain the the profit for 50 to 100 years. And for this case, they 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 plan to gain the profit for 100 years, which is, won't be there. So I, I, I show you why. And, and the profit that they, they wish to gain is uh, uh, this one, chili, and this one, rice and, um, rice and um, um, sugar cane. So most of the profit that they plan to get is from agriculture. Uh, to supply the water for agriculture. But what they always claim that the dam will help, uh, will, 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 will also help to um, protect the flood, you know, it's only 1%, actually, the, the profit is only 1%. And, um, and, and the energy is only 2%. So actually, um, 
I'm not sure it's worth for us to destroy the, the forest for, for this. And, and actually, uh, because of this, uh, the researcher that they found that the chili actually won't take a lot of, you know, we, we not really produce a lot of chili that much as they claim actually. And, and, and you know that chili is not uh, economically caused. Uh, is, is, is that uh, um, is that worth to to destroy the whole you know forest for for, for chili plantation but uh, but also the chili itself in the reality that people not plant it a lot because because it, it's not it's not expensive you know um, so Uh, also, if if the environment uh, start to restore, if it's all destroy, big thing destroy, and and it start to restore, and because of the gap of the period of the restore, um, the area um, is quite big. Um, the knowledge that should be passed from generation to generation is kind of lost or quite quite of limit. The new generation need to take time again to learn how to doing, uh, learning to, by doing many times in order to understand how the best to live there and what we can, what can be the win-win situation to live peacefully and maintain the nature and what is the native tree and birds, fish, animal, insects, uh, and what kind of food and medicine is the best for environment. So it's, there will be a lot more questions to discover in order to restore and to understand the nature again. So um, I think it is a big question that is that worth to do it? But uh, by, by, by this question, I want to show you the, the, the historical image of this scenic green dam um, when they start to build a dam. Um, uh, I believe this 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 process is quite similar to another dam uh, that I work on is Pumipon Dam on the Ping River, which is in a similar period and also built by um, American um, American company. Uh, this is a picture of the river that before the dam built, just a uh, small small like this, and then they start to um, Busting the site and build road, right? And grounding taste and, uh, and, and then drill, drill the rocks in the area and be, start to build the dam and also the tunnel under the dam. And all in all, they changed a huge amount of uh, earth. The whole project is big and it was a, a good forest and it looked like this. Um, and what they want to gain, uh, this example of Pumipon Dam that I worked on 10 years ago. And you can see the image of the full capacity of the, the Pumipon Dam when they can uh, uh, collect a huge amount of, of uh, water. This is in 2011, at the end of 2011, when this dam collect a lot of water and not release the water at all for agriculture that year. And they release it at the end of the year because of too, too, too many water. And it's also caused a big flood in the central of Thailand and including Bangkok. So that the image they might imagine that what they will gain. And, and we also travel up north uh, from the dam uh, up north to near the have not in toward the origin of the river, and you see a big lake uh, on that river. And uh, please look at this, uh, is this mountain. But uh, just this year, I go back there again. Um, so at, at that time, it looked like this. And the big boat like this can host in that, in that river. You know, the so the uh, floating house. Uh, 
other side, we not really know. Actually, it's quite kind of usual image that we see from the dike or the, uh, the dam. It look like that. It's this dike in um, one dike on um, Ping River as well. Um, and in Wangpan dike, also sometimes, many times, is uh, some broken and they this in this image to destroy it and build a, a much bigger one. And look at the uh, a dam. Uh, when they when they shut the the dam, uh, they, um, it's kind of destroy the whole environment because look at the fishing fishing boat. The uh, the people needs to abandon the boat because there is no water and no fish for them to to get you know and and then the water quality looks very very bad actually actually not only around the dam that the quality of the water is look like this but uh, in around the, the whole area uh, you can see similar things um again i go back to the lake the lake that we just have a look when when I visit the Pumi Pond Dam, uh, to re revisit the lake, it look like that. In the image, it looks look like it's pretty, but actually it's come from this image. Um, I went to the place in the similar season, you know, um, this one at the end of the year, 2011, this one beginning of the year, 2021. So from the big lake, it's become like, like this. And, and now uh, you remember this one that I told you, I, I, standing, I standing there to look at this image. So actually to standing there, you should be able to look at the big lake, but uh, there is no big lake like that. And it's not happened this year. Actually, it's happened so many years already. Um, but except the year that I went for shooting, uh, it's a starting year. So that's why the lake is kind of full of water. But it's the norm, usual image that, that the lake will look like. Um, from that mountain, when I look, uh, when I look at the big picture, I see this, right? The, the, the lake become very small rivers. And I want to zoom in this image. i show you more about that. So in this image, actually, this is where the, the big boat was up 10 years ago when I traveled there. And we parked here in order to get, uh, to get in, Got get off actually, but now we need to drive a car along to that river. And you remember this house? It's a floating house with the red roof. Now it's become like this. Um, so yeah, that's the. I think uh, I want to end with this image too. Uh, leave the questions uh, through the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Song, to show us how things were changed so dramatically. Um, so, after your presentation, we will take you to another place back to Indonesia uh, with Pilla, who will take us to the garden. Can Pilla share your? Presentation, please. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, um, this presentation, I'm going to share uh, my journey moving inward. I I'm going to call this this. So, um, for the last uh, fifteen years. I'm working as an artist, a, um, uh, so in my art, I'm talking about um, 
mostly like everyday life, you know, like simple things, um, food. I talk about food a lot. And then, um, uh, next. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. So um, the reason I'm talking about food is I think food um, not only creating our culture, uh, the human culture in the whole, but also it changes the nature because of how we produce our food. So I see like the industrialization of food actually is the root of the you know, problems we are facing today. So from the pollution, land dispute, flood, hunger, drought, waste, problem, disease, war, or, um, water conflict, and many other things. And um, uh, yeah, so uh, um, uh, I, I have becoming an angry artist during my activity as an artist because I know about this problem, but I, I, I cannot do anything other than making artworks addressing this problem. So yeah, so that that was my journey moving, uh, you know, uh, outward before, like until 2016. And then um, in 2016, I have a chance to to live in a in a land uh, of my family, and then to to work on the land. Um, then I start to move inward. Uh, so I somehow transform from being an artist into a farmer. Um, so like the last. Since 2016, I'm not really active as an artist. I still do some artworks, but I spend most of my time in the field. So, um, so I'm transforming from being an artist, addressing environmental issues regarding to food um, production, and um, transforming into a farmer with the needless. Um, lifestyle, start to produce my own food, and start to taking part in initiating a better ecosystem. I will go back a little bit to the this uh, problem, yeah, with the industrialization of food. I, um, yeah, we all know that uh, this, most of the food we, uh, the, the world is eating today, came from this industry. Um, so the, the problem is starting from how, how the, the plant or the animal are planted, breed, feed, catch, processed, stored, distributed, advertised, and the end there will be waste because they all came in packaging. So, yeah, that those process leads to all of this, this uh, problem. And yeah, I, I realized that because we, we all need to eat. So yeah, so food become very important. And so it can make or break how our life, something like this. So yeah, so with that uh, realization, I decided to, you know, transform myself to become less angry farmer. So, uh, yeah, from there, uh, yeah. So that that that's the idea. So I start to work in the farm, in the land, since 2016. But in the beginning, uh, uh, we we because we don't have any background as a farmer. I, I grew up in the city, even like my grandparents live in the city. So they, they 
I don't know how to work in the land. But when I was an artist, I I um, I live in my parents' house, and we have like um, like three square meters of you know corner empty space, and I begin to do some like small gardening, and because you know like even like for people say, when I say like uh, oh yeah I'm, I work as an artist they said oh yeah it's so fun la 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 but actually it can be stressful working as an artist so the guard the garden becomes my you know like to release my stress so I I work in that small garden before <clears throat> and then when I moved to like 2016 I moved to another place it was like in my parents' house, it was like three square meters or something like this. And the, the, the new land, it's probably 5,000 square meters. And, and, and we, we start to <laughs> try to work on this land. And um, uh, since we don't have any experience, so we, we just follow our intuition. So we think like, ah, oh, the best place, I mean, like uh, the example is forest because it, it they they can produce food a lot of food you know like like so we try to oh how we can create a forest so we try to we start to collect um, seeds or no plants from from neighbors or from from our family or you know from anyone and then we start to plant them some grow some doesn't but we just try and then um, um, maybe about three years ago we start to you know um, because we start gardening and then we start to meet another gardener through social media and then we start to um, get this uh, uh, guidance how to work the, the garden and then we found about permaculture in the beginning, which is a movement in the 70s in Australia, where they, they, they give guidance how to make this permaculture from empty plot. And, uh, and which, which this, this permaculture is practiced by most of the new gardeners, you know, like young gardeners um, in, in Bandung or um, around uh, West Java, which we know. And then uh, from there, like few, maybe last year or something, we found about this natural farming method and philosophy, which was um, uh, uh, Masanobu Fukuoka is the, the, the person who, who invent this. So it was, he started this in the 40s in Japan, where he worked on orange orchard and rice field uh, and, and um, doing to, um, so his, his philosophy is do less. So um, uh, why don't we don't do this instead of why don't we do this to, to grow food? So for his, uh, so in his um, method, he, he, um, he don't do um, fertilizer, don't do uh, tilling. He don't, so he basically he said, just spread the seed and then harvest. That's what human uh, us uh, should be doing in the natural farming method. And then, uh, and then last year, we start to work on the rice field. So it's like another level. It's not, you know, like farming, like garden is something, and then rice field is another thing. It's like another level for us because it takes like a lot of energy and concentration and everything. Uh, we haven't done the natural farming because for that we need to really know the land, like the 
um, so yeah, it's really really need to understand the animal, the 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 insect, the climate, the water, everything. So we haven't really done that. Uh, but so when I was invited to join this pollination, uh, I was trying to find the myth um, um, about rice, and then I finally found this Nihokohachi myth, which was actually part of our uh, inheritance. So it comes from our ancestor. So it's actually very close to us, but somehow I just found out about this, like almost the last. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, so now, uh, so in the myth of Ipohachi, so the yeah, it was a long story, but the the point where we um, which we take is like the the biodiversity that was um, said in the myth, like the the Nipohachi was was killed and then buried, and then from her body grows like from the head grows a coconut, and then from the mouth and the nose comes. Um, vegetables and uh, from the hair comes um, grass and flowers and then from the belly button comes rice and yeah and uh, other things and it, it shows the uh, the like the plants that was needed for human to live so and and it shows many 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 different kinds of plants not only like for food but also for for tools, for house, and everything. So, but we haven't, yeah, it's another task to understand the myth because I think myth is not only like a story, but it has a knowledge um, and also um, wisdom. It's it's like the most important, like the Nipohachi um, myth. I, I know that the, they, I still I heard about this, and some farmers are still um, uh, during the harvest. They still like inviting Nipohachi spirit or something like this. But the, I think the the one that was left, not the that was still exist now, is not the wisdom, but the ritual. So maybe in some part, like the the very close. Um, um, Society, like um, like uh, in some uh, villages, which are still very strong, keep the, the the culture strong. They they still have this wisdom, but like mo the other, the most farmers are you know they they do the the ritual for the nipohachi during the harvest, for example, but they use pesticides. So. I don't think it's, it's so. It's more like the ritual they still do, but not the wisdom of the Nipohachi, something like this. So, yeah, all the all the method we're still learning because it's still very new. But but we think like oh, uh, ours we we start in we start in the in the right direction because all of these three guidance said about biodiversity so so yeah it's uh so we are aiming to 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 have a biodiversity so um, yeah we we collect plants so now we we start we keep on collecting plants especially that those were not we lost in the market, which means lost in the garden and possibly lost in the wild because the forest are um, getting, you know, like changed into garden and the, or farm, which grows mostly like monoculture. Yeah, because most of like conventional farm is still happening. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's I think. 
And uh, yeah, also I think most importantly is we also try to, because our place is, it's, 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 it's a house, yeah? With, with the garden and everything. And we also have sometimes like uh, family, friends or uh, family or friends with little kids. So we try to reintroduce these kids to where their food comes from, because I think the now generation, the younger generation, even some of us are starting to be detached from where our food come from. Like for some kids now, they don't really know where the rice comes from, or they know that it comes from shop or from a box or from, yeah. So another mission of us is to to give a, a next, uh, yeah, kids who comes to our place to, to reattach to the nature and to know where their food comes from. Yeah, so I think that's my, yeah. So I'll give the screen back to Kima. Thank you so much, Pilar. For those who didn't see uh, Pilar video works on Nippohashi as well with the Prima Kauja, you can see her video works in, at Gray Center. Uh, you can find this on the link uh, in in the website as well. So next, I would like to invite Agung Hajere now, our responder, to respond to our presenter today. Okay, thank you, Kitima. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to become a respondent or discussion in this session. <clears throat> but first of all, allow me to take this opportunity to congratulate especially the curators and the artists for uh, their achievement in this project. Um, I can only share you some short notes as a response to the wonderful, wonderful presentations by all panelists, uh, Som, Wood, and also Elizabeth and Pila. Thank you so much. I've been enjoying, uh, I, enjoy, I really enjoy listening to what you have shared about your works and research. And <clears throat> I would also like to uh, say just a few words about, about this project. As Zoe Butt uh, has repeatedly mentioned and also uh, written well in every introduction about this project, actually pollinations is a project that for me seeks to find layers of, of relations, uh, by which I mean social relations between artists and curators. And within this framework, uh, we know that these two types of actors, uh, curator and artist, are usually bound by uh, activity called exhibition. And in an, in an, in, in an exhibition, we usually know that uh, the respective divisions of work between artist and curator is usually very clear. The artist makes works or uh, create artworks and the curator usually mount the artworks in an exhibition. Um, I think there was a time when, when artists uh, became the main actor, the main actor in, in this kind of stage. Um, is the main star in the in an in exhibition, but we also know how in the past ten years the role of curator also has become more central as an exhibition holder. In this latest trend, an exhibition or project is sometimes more important than the works it, uh, than the artwork itself. Uh, ideas from curators or the exhibition title, for instance. Uh, dominate the work concept and usually really influence the way people uh, perceive about art. But in this project, I think it is important also to emphasize how uh, all the curators and the artists, uh, Kitima, Lir, and uh, especially Rungsak and Marianto, 
have moved away from such stereotype. From yesterday's session, we have heard from the curators and artists that they collaboration result in a learning experience and they have learned a lot from each other ideas. Um, <clears throat> uh, my other response is to this uh, symposium format. Uh, yesterday, it was man also mentioned that this symposium was actually uh, also a kind of response to the limitation in the uh, pandemic situation. And but by doing the symposium online, I think uh, this project has also uh, add a new complement. And the exhibition uh, in the end is just probably just one of the results of the project. Um, <clears throat> this third edition of Pollination, uh, I think has expanded the, this, the spectrum of activities that we, we uh, me, Zoe and Natasha and Fipas uh, imagine in the, in the first place. <clears throat> the curators have worked uh, very hard as the managing editors for the website. They have select writers, researchers, thinkers, all the panelists in the session, yesterday's session and tomorrow. And the result is that um, uh, the issue on environmentalism or ecology has uh, expanded uh, very well. So uh, again, I would like to congratulate you all for uh, uh, this achievement. So um, my second point, which is actually a response to this uh, uh, session's uh, topic, uh, probably related to this term uh, or some terms that repeatedly mentioned by all the panelists, which is nature, environment. And uh, I think we have uh, heard that these two terms are discussed in, in, in the framework of how we, we understand the nature in Southeast Asia. From Som and Wood, we have learned a lot about how the river culture and the environment uh, around the river are still very much alive in Thailand, but at the same time are threatened by massive changes uh, by the human intervention. From Ibu Elizabeth, we, ha we have also learned a lot about uh, the extinction of the big uh, heritage, the Buddhist culture in Muara Jambi. That was also, uh, uh, that was, that used to be also kind of central um, place for, for um, a culture that is built around the river. And uh, I think from Ibu Elizabeth, Sam and Wood, we, 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 <clears throat> we see, we, we, can, we can actually uh, understand how the river culture in Southeast Asia is actually essential in, in many, many people's life. And it's interesting uh, for me to, to, to hear about uh, a story about Borju, uh, 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 an artist that uh, Ibu Elizabeth has worked with. Uh, and, <clears throat> And from Ibu Elisa, uh, I understand how art activities initiated and carry, carried out by local people can also raise awareness about the importance of, uh, of how we have to care about the cultural heritage. And uh, from Pila, we have also heard how her thoughts about nature have led her to make uh, a big change in her life and uh, to choose uh, to live with a very personal lifestyle uh, which is eco-friendly and also a bit ascetic yeah a bit ascetic and <clears throat> with all in all uh, so allow me to just throw a probably a big question and this may sound uh, a bit rhetoric as well 
because I, I I've been curious about how we understand the term nature. And considering that you all have a lot of experience doing research and, and work with uh, nature, uh, I've been provoked to ask uh, uh, to what extent we can actually set the limit uh, for the purity of nature, the purity of nature. Uh, do we really have to always preserve the purity of nature? And, and by purity, I, I refer to this state of permanence. And, and uh, we, have, uh, we have heard a lot about this term, uh, sustainability. But I also sometimes think that it is also natural for a nature uh, to change, uh, to change itself, you know. And uh, well, uh, this, is, this, this might sound uh, rhetoric, but I think it will be really interesting to expand the discussion in this session uh, by discussing this, uh, this, this question. And uh, uh, I'm not expecting any kind of theoretical or philosophical answers, but I would really love to hear your personal reflections uh, from all the panelists about this. Uh, I think that's, that's for now, uh, Kitima. Uh, back to you, thank you. Thank you. For anyone who wants to answer our question first, maybe it can go with Elizabeth. Good. Okay. Mm. Wow. Thank you, uh, Masagung. Uh, uh, I like especially your last uh, consideration about uh, nature, yeah, the concept of nature. If we go back to the Indonesian word, uh, yeah, alam. Alam is also the universe, yeah? It's not the nature. And universe, as we know, is changing. The Big Bang is expanding, it's destro destroying itself, it keeps changing. And what is also interesting in Indonesian language, from Alam, we have Mengalami, to experience, yeah? So the, the nature is also experience, experiencing. It's not static. It's not like you, yeah, the question you say, should we uh, really keep the purity of the nature? Is there something like a purity of nature? So this is my uh, answer to you, this uh, consideration. And I don't know in other languages, in Thai or in Vietnamese, or if you have also different concept, maybe we can uh, share, please. Uh, so, do you want to share something regarding to this question of Akung as well? Yeah, actually, I think that this, I think similar to Elizabeth in the way that the, the nature is it's changeable, right? It's changeable before, I mean, for example, for the dams or the river uh, uh, case, it's always changed. It's flood and then drought and then, you know, is always like that, but the change is is from I mean, but this change is st still bearable for me because it's, uh, for example, when we grow the tree, uh, the tree the, uh, when it's flood, um, or fire or drought, sometimes the same tree, uh, is depend on the type of tree still can grow after that situation pass. It's, it's temporary. It's not like permanently uh, um, stop the nature to grow. But for, the, uh, for me, the, um, the big or large scale uh, electricity dam is, is kind of, uh, it's not easy to change it, it's, it's look, it's look close to permanent to, to shut down the flow of the river and to stop, stop the nature itself. It should, it should flow as it should be, but it it's, it's can be. And for, for a long, long time, and for a very big scale of change. Uh, so that is, um, um, I think is, is quite, uh, difficult to get back. Uh, I mean, it's, 
if one day it stops, maybe it's possible to restore it again. But as I said in my presentation, it takes quite a long time and we will lose a lot of knowledge uh, between that. So that's what I mean. Thank you so much. Um, maybe Pilar, you also want to share something? Yeah, it's um, for me, it's nature is a very complicated thing. And we're just like a tiny part of it. But somehow, because we human thinks that we can control the nature, I think that's, that's the problem. Because, um, yeah, the way we behave now, I think we have that, that thought in our head, like, like, yeah, we can control the nature with, with our technology, something like this. But I think, yeah, yeah, we, we can think this way, but nature have ways to balance itself. So if we try to do something too much, then nature will, you know, like go back to us, like, I don't know, a big way, something like this. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's how, yeah, nature works. So it's, it's not um, standing still, but it's, it's, it's changing and it's changing, I think because human are the most creature that makes the nature change speak up yeah you know so yeah it's it's yeah the, it changes according uh, yeah what we do yeah it, it will affect the nature something like this i think yeah thank you and uh maybe would you raise your hand and i will let you also answer this question as well okay so as uh, everybody said that uh, nature is dynamic uh, in, in my opinion, it's especially I deal, uh, my project is dealing with the big construction which create a lot of uh, consequence. In my point of view, uh, I think the purity of the, of the nature in this uh, modern world and the modern society, I think we, we cannot, it's almost impossible to make it pure, as pure as possible. I think we must talk about awareness of the consequence of this kind of activity of this uh, human intervention to the nature. This is my point of view uh, toward this uh, question and the, the term of the nature. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Thank you. I think this like presentation go really fast. It's only an hour and 17 minutes, but uh, just throw out here first, if anyone who joined this uh, talk today would like to share your thought or also have any question that you would like to share, feel free to type in the chat box and then we will raise up the question to the speaker. Uh, meanwhile, I will let this to Agung more if Agung would like to ask more questions as well. Well, if I may, I would like to maybe ask uh question to you uh, Kitima maybe <laughs> because you've been you've been working uh, in this project uh, for a long time and 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 I'm sure you have uh, many findings about how artists in these two countries uh, and uh, two uh, different cultural environment um, uh, uh, have some similarities in response to the, 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 the you know the curatorial ideas that you and and Lear, uh, have developed, or maybe if not similarities, maybe differences. Yeah, if I may answer this on behalf of Lear as well, mm -hmm. I think the way that we selecting this participant is regarding on their like their brilliant mind who also do this research for a long time. And I think it's really important to hear from these people as well regarding to our like selected artists who work on this subject. For example, like I really text from Elizabeth a really, really inspiring me. Like the idea of the golden Iceland and it's actually really something that conflict with Thai belief as well that we also believe that's one of whom 
area is supposed to be the area in the mainland Bangkok thing. Sorry, Elizabeth, but uh, I mean, your tech is super inspiring. And um, with the idea of how, how people that are actually working collaboratively is such and really inspire. I think with Indonesian artistic community and practice are super inspired in the way that you guys work collaboratively and collectively, which one of the most significant things as well in the artistic practice community. Uh, means why Pilar showed something else that kind of like she came a lot from and it's also answered the question yesterday of what artists of what role of the artist can do when you act, act or working regardless on environmental issues instead of being just all the artists and um the thing is like she moved away from being artist and being a less angry uh farmer which also still practice and this Later on, I would like also to ask Pila that how her practice has been changed after being a gardener and farmer as well. Uh, this will be a question to Pila later. And I think for here to hear Wood speaking, I think it's really compliment on the whole project as Wood is an observer and to see it the beginning of the issue that we discussed on Mekong River as the recent building of Sayabudi Dam would actually present the things scenario in its beginning of what's going to happen. It's just like a fortune teller forecast what's going to happen next. And um, I'm a fan and would like to see what's going to happen next step in the future and his practice as well. Meanwhile, some of the artists who also working and devoting her time really long on this ecology issue in different uh, projects such as a um, power supplement and like electric in Tokyo to the dams and many projects that have been, uh, been developed for many years. And it's not just only dam close to her house, she kind of explore, explore more in different dam that happen to Thailand and our neighbor as well. So I think with this kind of knowledge that um, this contributor help, is help us to understand more about the ecology things that happen nearby our house. And I think it's really important as well. I think people have different battle to fight and this artist was great and important um, issue on ecology um, problem as well that we also need to be concerned uh, to the contemporary times. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, thank yeah. you. May, may I ask Pila after regarding to what I'm just asking, because I really feel also really inspired by you, Pila, on, on how brave you are and move away from being just only angry artist to a less angry farmer. Did your artistic practice change after being farmer for many years as well? Yes, so, um, yeah, the, um, since 2016, I haven't really done many exhibition after spending time in the field. But um, yeah, the last few works, I I try to. I'm more interested to um, to have uh, to the so the audience. I'd like them to uh, be part of the work. So. Um, most of the work I work after being a farmer, I like the so the work, the end result of the work is actually done by the the audience. So I uh, try to involve the audience. So actually, their their action is is um. So they don't really see the work as a like you know like a work and themselves, but they are part of the work because what they do will be will yeah will 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 make the work something like this because I think that's the also like in reality our action like simple action like um, 
like shopping or buying food is actually it's like we're voting every time you know, like in democracy world we we our choose is our choice is is affecting not uh, only ourselves but many things so so i'd like to use that in in my art pra practice so yeah i i like to involve the audience not only be like a passive viewer but they're also part of the, the work something like this toward like more audience participatory but the subject is still regarded on this food production industry right yeah still related to food yeah like the the food they choose how it will affect the market and then the garden at the end that that was one of my work um, the title is um, democratization of carb carbohydrates because we have like a lot of selection of carbohydrates but of course but somehow we only um, in the market there's only like meat or rice or you know but we also have other choice actually, but as, as if we don't have any other choice. So like in, in the work, I, I give all the choice. So yeah, you can choose. If you don't choose, then the, if there's something you not chosen, then it will be disappear. Something like this, because I think that's what's happening. If like um, nobody wants to eat, for example, cassava, then it will disappear. And yeah. nobody advertise cassava. Nobody wants to eat cassava, something like this. I really agree when I, I did translate, um, help proofread your translate work. And then we try to have like, because I think in English tech, you still leave some word like ubi, uvu, and, and, and this. And then we don't, we kind of think that, do, did we have the same in Thai? Can I actually translate that name of that? Uh, plan to Thai for the Thai audience as well. Is it really important that it's actually like local plant down there in, in Indonesia and then that's, doesn't present at all in, in Thai? And it's really interesting that there's many type of carbohydrate plant, but then we only select to eat only a few, right? Yeah, really cool. What hmm. actually Uwi is? What, what is Uwi? I'm really curious. So maybe not many Indonesian also know about this, but it's, uh, it's Dios Korea Alata, the, the, the Latin name. So it's, it's, we have two kinds of ubi. It's like the, the ubi that, that, that the, the, the leaf goes on the ground like this, but the other ones is like the one that grows up. And the, the ubi, the one I, I talked about in the, the work is, is the one that grows up, up, up. It's the, we call them ubi rambat. We know about the ubi jala, but less about the ubi rambat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Wish I was able to eat it one day when this pandemic <laughs> in and I'm able to fly across to Indonesia. Yes. And uh, Agung, do you have more questions for the participant? Not for now. I think Ibu Elizabeth just raised her hand and also, oh. If you would like to allow uh, the audience to throw questions. Okay, so Elizabeth, please. Oh, yes. I would like to respond to Prila, may I? Uh, just saying that uh, I don't know about Thailand, but I'm sure it's the same. In Indonesia, what is amazing is that uh, all the art comes from the village. You know, even in Europe, in the language, we have culture and agriculture. I mean, it's the same route. But uh, this is not so true now, now anymore in Europe. But in Indonesia, of course, we know Bali. We know that the arts come from the village in Bali. But that's not only Bali. In, in Java, in every village, there is at least music, dance, rituals. And in Sumatra, in Muara Jambi, I was, I'm so amazed. They have poetry. They have uh, the tikar, the, the nuts. Every, all the, it's a language by itself. And, and now that they have the, the technology, the young people very quickly, they catch up. 
and they make e extremely fascinating movie. I had no time to show you some movies, but I, next time maybe on, on the website. It's amazing how they catch up. And why? Because I think the farmers, so there is no contradiction to be a farmer and an artist. I mean, farmers are artists because they uh, express gratitude to the nature. That was the first uh, expression of art, I think. And, and mm. that's why uh, I think this is very, I mean, to be a farmer is to be an artist. <laughs> yes, that's what I wanted to. Yeah. Agree. Then I might ask some question to Elizabeth as well as a your take. First of all, I have to say that your take is really inspiring me. But um, one of the things that you also present on your presentation as well is a cover of the book called Dreams from the Golden Iceland that published in 2018 in different languages, right? If I understood it right. And you also mentioned that one word that is really interesting is called this book become an identity card of the villager of Murajambi. As after public this book, along with doing other stuff like reading poem, movie, it's become make more kind of like acknowledged for them to uh, get recognition by Indonesian authority and UNESCO. I would like you to share more about this as well, that how these cultural things can give like bigger impact to society and acknowledge for the authority as well. Uh, yes, so we decided to make this book a few years ago because first we wanted to, together with the villagers, build a house of wisdom and knowledge, a small miniature of the university, you know? Uh, but then I thought if we make a building and then it costs money and we should first know exactly about the history, the background of the villagers. And otherwise, you know, we have an empty shell and it costs a lot of money to, uh, to, to keep the, the building, uh, you know, functioning. So that's what came out the idea. And of course, the villagers at the time were really regarded by the archaeologists, by the uh, academics, by the uh, military authorities, government authorities, like marginal people, stupid people. Uh, I remember very well, you know. So they said to the archaeologists, oh, we are doing a book with Elizabeth. And they were laughing, you know. I said, don't say a book about Muarajambi. Just say we make a book about Dongeng, about uh, fairy tales, uh, myth, legends, you know, a, a children book. We make a children book. So that's what, in a way, we did because there are many illustrations. And what was the function of this book? Yes, as an identity card, because uh, you cannot, it's a foundation. If you don't know your identity, you cannot build that foundation. So I, I really uh, uh, suggested them to, to start to ask questions about their ancestors, uh, about their ancestors, that how they, they found out about, about the mask and the leper stories and so on. And now we use this book, why we made it in four languages, Chinese, Indonesian, English, and French, because uh, there are many Chinese visitors, you know, it's a Buddhist place. They come from uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, even mainland China in pilgrimage. And they of course ignore the villagers, you know, because they are Malayu, dark skin, Muslim, so they don't, and, and they come just to, 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 to pay attention or their devotions to ruins, to those uh, temples. So they ignore the local population, so there can be a conflict very soon, you know, against uh, economical conflict, religious conflict. And the book is a trick because on the cover, it's written in Chinese also. So the villagers, they come from uh, maybe 50 meters far away and they show the book. So the Chinese pilgrims, they think, well, what are those strange people? But then they see the Chinese writing, so they, they approach, they open the book, and then in the book, it's all about Yitzing, about Chinese history in Chinese. So they started to be fascinating. And there is, they, then they sit together with the villager, with the translator. And the book is really a tool to bring the people together on the side. That's, but now we need to build a place, you know, so people can really meet, not outside on the open air. So the book had this function. And of course, it raised respect by the authorities. And uh, like I said, now that you have the Minister of Culture and uh, Education, that uh, commission uh, movies to this uh, group of young people to make movies 
about the culture in other villages in uh, the province of Jambi. So this book is so important yeah, as a tool. And of course, we sell the books. And with the money of the book, we are by building the foundation of the House of Wisdom. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, I mean, multi-functions, this book. Yeah. Kitima, your microphone. Sorry. And uh, for those who didn't know yet, uh, Elizabeth does not only work on Olympia's work, but she also write another important book and that inspired uh, my co-curator, uh, Lear, with Dito, you know, when uh, Mira is reading this, that taking one of the story from Elizabeth's book, The White Bayan, the story of Barata, the mighty hunter, and it's becoming a name of our exhibition in Chiang Mai, Thailand as well. And also another thing that in the chat box, um, Salasa, uh, thanks to Christine, kind enough to post the link of video of um, uh, pillar works here from Gray Center. If you guys didn't see, please feel free to check in, check it out. And uh, is that any question from, from uh, Touches uh, from the audience. I didn't see any yet. Uh, yeah, we have several questions. Oh, from... oh really? Is the essential on mine? How can I see question? I'm sorry. Oh, Q and A session, open session. Okay, so there's one from Zoe here that I I see. She said, I love how the mass that Elizabeth discussed with the community in Indonesia offered a powerful metaphor which wished to carry forward the memory of their ancestor. More broadly speaking, I think of art as a kind of mask with which memory, memory is almost transmitted. The mask for me is also a form of resilience. To that aim, what to do artists, writer offer as means of resilience to the topic that, that they study? What does resilience mean in such practice? Is it collaborative ritual, teaching, collective making? How can visual art offer space in which the violence of extraction that you all share? That's really long. Um, can be critical engaged a story that is shared be given alternate passive par, uh, perception sorry who do you feel are your target audience so I think this is um, quite long but then you can chop into to uh, each question by maybe you should start, start by Elizabeth again may I Yes, then shortly, so other people have the time to speak. So yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Zoe. Yes, it's yes, of course, it's very, I don't like to use the word resilient because it has been very fashionable, you know, trendy. Yeah? But I think resilience is to, uh, uh, like uh, Prila said, you know, not to get angry, you know, don't get angry about the events outside you, change yourself from the inside, because how can we face the big damage of, humans, you know, when you see the dams, the, the, the scale of destruction. So the main thing, at least we create peace inside of ourselves. And on a funny way, in Imuara Jambi, they create peace around them then, you know, and they, they, they gain respect. And now they are growing. So I think, yes, uh, in that uh, sense, uh, and in the movie they made, there is a beautiful uh, scene where they put the mask in the forest, you know, they, they act like their ancestors as lepers. And they make the they, they take a, a, a dry pumpkin and put the, put it on their face and then they come back to the village and they said, "We are the mask. The mask are are we." Yeah, yes. Topeng adalah kita, kita adalah topeng. So it's it's amazing. Yeah. So it's not just a metaphor. It's really yes. It's it's really reality. Yeah. And yes. Thank you. Uh, maybe some you want to try and answer this as well? Yeah, I think we can only 
change ourselves and it's enough uh, for me. Um, mm -hmm. We need still to uh, inform what's, uh, what's happening in the big scale. And we need to also, um, uh, how do you say that, uh, awareness of, of what's happening. Um, I, I, for me, because we can, um, because to only change ourselves is, is still not enough. I mean, everyone want to change ourselves, want to, uh, you know, adapt ourselves in the best, uh, um, best way to, to live, right? But I think in the same time, we need also to aware of the, the, the bigger um, planet that uh, change. And we, in order to do that, we need to inform or uh, as an artist, maybe you inform it through your artworks or to, to inform that and to show what's happening. And so other people, more people can aware of that issue and, and uh, perhaps it can, uh, can help to lead to a better solution, I think. Because we, we anyway, we live together in, in, the, in the same area, in the same country. Or, um, and, and so we need to try, we need to be able to push what, what we want it to be, I think. So, uh, I, mm. who do you think is going to be like your target audience for? Um, I think general general audience will be my target because uh, to to make people aware of 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 um, the story or, or the history or the changing um, is the way that they how they say that it's a way that they they know how to act back to the to the situation and. I think the more people who uh, know this or understand this, the more the uh, more we can push that. Uh, uh, can can push to solve the solution. I think, but I, I know that not every problem we can solve the, uh, uh, the the problem, but at least on the way we can. Um, uh, capture or we can keep the uh, evidence of what, what's going on and perhaps this uh, evidence can helpful you uh, for the future. We, we, we don't know it. So, but because before it changed uh, and we don't know when it will will be back or is never be back, but we at least know what's, what's in the past happened. We need to have a kind of choice to, to, know, to know what's what's in the past, what's happening in the past and until now by archiving some photograph or uh, text or for uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, she tried to also capture the moment of people, how they react with the situation there by the marks and, and so on. I think this uh, help uh, the next generation to, when they look back, they understand it. Mm. And they can use as a source to, to, to do something for their own future. Yes. I agree. Um, next, may I ask Wood as well about this question? Yes. Um, this is this is very uh, interesting and tough question. I was asked once as an artist, what what can we do to deal with this issue? I think this is quite general general. Uh, question once we deal with uh, this kind of uh, topic. So for me, the topic is so vast. Everywhere you touch is a problem. Uh, and it's almost impossible to cover the whole, the whole topic itself. For me, I, 
focus more to uh, pick up my uh, subject matter. What is really matter to me or to the artist? And I think this subject matter can create awareness. And once the community start putting things together, it's like putting piece by piece together, it can create a bigger picture of this uh, problem and to rise up the awareness of the society to this, to this situation, to the topic. Because for, at the moment, imagine that, uh, I, I'm, I don't think that people in Bangkok or in Singapore or in Vietnam realize that uh, a big chunk of uh, the power they use is come from Laos or from somewhere else. I, I, I think this is something that the art world, the art community can rise up the awareness and then it can push all the way through the policy maker or to the bigger society. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Pilar, can you share your thought on this question as well? Yeah, so about like, I just found the last one is the target audience. So like my audience now is not only in gallery space, because now I work also in our house, which is a garden. And we have um, people coming, family, friends, but also sometimes we have, um, before the COVID uh, pandemic, we have like school children coming to our garden. So they have become my audience. So, so, I, I, so we opened our um, house for this. So with my knowledge about, I mean, yeah, I just simply give them, or we give them a chance to, uh, we share about why we, we do this, and then we give them a chance to like um, see, feel nature. Uh, and also we have some families who are regularly come to our garden and then um, with their kids and to them, to the kids and also the parents, we, yeah, we, yeah, for the kids, we, we because we are also interested in education and there's something wrong with the education now, we think. So we, we try to, you know, like, like, like give something to, to the kids, like experience and then how to interact with the nature how to respect the nature, not only the human, but also the nature, you know, like when you see like a bug um, passing, you don't just squash them, you just let them go. And then you can enjoy um, um, animal flying. And then, so, yeah, so our, my audience, I mean, our, my target audience is now not only the gallery, people who went to the gallery or, yeah, because now I engage more with, yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's important to have um, younger generation as a target to, 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 uh, to give them um, like uh, Bacal, what is Bacal? Uh, something for their future. So, in the future, it's up to them, but we give them like, uh, um, this is what I think you should interact with the nature, something like this. Yeah. Mm. I agree. Interesting. I think the issue of education is everywhere here in Southeast Asia as well. Another problem to speak about. And um, thank you for the answer. I will ask another question from the audience for you. Um, it's from anonymous attendee. Are human ourselves not part of the nature? Trust making our decision in terms of changing the world around us as being nature decision as well. 
I think this is interesting in terms of the dynamic between permanent change to temporary ones. As one side of the human ecosystem is trying to permanently change their world, while other is trying to keep their purity, it's as if nature fighting against itself in uh, perpetuity. Sorry, per perpetuity. Hmm. More like a comment. And, uh, but anyone would like to share on this I, uh, comment as well? I, I have a short comment on this because this mm -hmm. might uh, have to do with my previous provocation about mm -hmm. uh, the permanence and change. Uh, I think the idea of having a harmonious life with the nature is not, not so popular among us. Yeah. Even though, I mean, if we say, I, I mean, if we ask our human, uh, our humans part of the nature, then uh, people in the, people who live in the jungle, like, you know, a uh, 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 hundred years ago, maybe we, they, was, they would say yes, you know, because they, 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 they experienced the, the, uh, the, you know, they live with that surrounding in which, you know, um, uh, they have to live in the nature. I think the modern culture has, has changed that, you know, that way of life, that uh, nature is another entity that has to be, you know, has to be uh, conquered and human is the most superior, you know, creature uh, in the universe, for instance, that's that's very much um, uh, dominant, I think, until now, you know. So uh, I think that the the, the question uh, about whether human is part of the nature uh, maybe can 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 be answered by, by Pila's, you know, Pila's way of life, which is, you know, it, we know this is very new, very new uh, way of life among, you know, mm. among us, you know. Agree. Maybe Pila can talk more about your prima culture as well. Living with nature. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, yeah, because we, the, um, the, the, the way we live now, I mean, in the garden, we try to yeah, be harmonious with the nature. Like for example, like the, we, we are doing harvesting the rice field uh, for three weeks now, which is unacceptable for the for true farmers, I think. <laughs> it takes too long, but because I'm doing it, just, just me and my husband is doing it. Um, and we're just quite new with this, so it's a bit bit that. So, like um, in the beginning, we try to to shoo the birds because the birds are coming, you know, eating the the rice. But then we 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 see that actually they are not eating the rice we ate. They they are eating the the you know like the young rice or the rice that has infected by worm underneath. So not like, not the perfect rice because the perfect rice is very hard to bite. So we think like, ah, oh, maybe it's, it's just our greed, you know, like we want to take all the rice, but actually like the bird, they take some little bit of this and then the worm they take a little bit of this. So, so I think it's, yeah, yeah, we, we're just part, small part of the nature. So if we can be less greed, then we'll be fine with that. We can share those with them. It's, they're, they're not greedy. The, the, the one that's greedy is us. So they're not taking our part. We're taking their part, something like this. So yeah, that's, I think, I don't know if that's answered the question. Does it answer? Yeah, I think so. I think it shares some past experience. Yeah. 
I think it's also share some kind of yeah. experience like living with nature as well. But I think to just for sharing something in the beginning when I did a research on this project has come out of one of theory called convivo conservation as a way of living life like 50% with uh, what we are in like city and forest merging together, like not just only pro 100% nature or pro 100% city, but it has to be 50-50 and blending together. I think it's one of the theory that's really interesting. It's just like to draw out if anyone interested, it called uh, convivo conservation. And also to beginning with this project as well as this comment, is it the nature of fighting against itself enough? Well, um, in the beginning of the project, and when I started this project together with a co-curator, we met in Bandung, and it's um, the first time that the pandemic just start. And we think this is somehow the way that, and that time that's not so sure yet what this coronavirus came from. And then we actually moved from something that is actually start from human eating the bat and we get receiving the virus from the market in Wuhan, right? So we think that maybe it's some time of this nature strike imposed to us as a human and kind of like protesting something as well. And with that, this project has start and begin on the idea that we want to explore more about the issue of ecology and nature and it's become of hunter and gatherer. So does anyone else want to share as well? Oh, Alyssa, let you raised the hand earlier, right? Or you want to also share something, please? Yes, uh, if I may, uh, about how you can going with the flow of nature. And this is very literal in Warajambi. And as Masagung said, how the importance of rivers in Southeast Asia. Yeah, the Batanghari River has floods twice a year at least, you know, because of the monsoon from the volcano. So it comes down, the big rain, and the river uh, level of the river goes to one or two meters. That's why they build their houses on tile. But they don't call it floods there. It's high tide. And it's a very, it's, it's like very, uh, it's a, it's a, 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 a a favor to have this uh, high tide when it comes. And you know, they have not only built the house on tiles, but they have small boats under the house. So when the, 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 the village is flooded, it becomes Venetia, yeah? And they, they go, the children go at school with the boats, they go to each other, they visit. The village becomes a big lake, they are very happy. And then when the tides got down, uh, the, the, uh, the land becomes very fertile. So uh, this is a way, you know, they don't look at it as clouds, but they really uh, accept this uh, movement of nature uh, as something natural and they adapt to it. So this is what just a response, you know, uh, how not to tell it as a dis natural disaster, but as a natural uh, 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 grace of a favor from the nature. Thank you. Son, do you want to share something as well? Not really, not, not really want to share. I think people already talk what I would like to say. So okay, to thank you. Yeah. So I would if you want to share something as well. Yeah, I think uh, every, everyone already covered pretty much everything already. So, yeah, it's a big world. And then we live for so long. Things will go oh. on and we will move on. That's my opinion toward the nature. Okay. And I guess this could be our last question for today. And I would like to, before I would like to uh, wrap up and in, um, I forget to mention something. I think you might already see, no, this, this one um, logo here is called Pollination. Um, this pollination project is actually initiated by the factory in 2018. The Pollination Hawaii and Emerging Curate.
Asia and artists in Southeast Asia the opportunity to co-produce, collaborate, um, to mutually benefit from this region private art infrastructure platform, recognize the value of sharing uh, their critical idea and activity. That's the reason that why we are here together with the support from this institution here. I think, I hope you see the logo, um, which was funded by the SAM Fund for Art and Ecology. And this has been a uh, three year with working together with our uh, Ilham Gary from Kuala Lumpur, uh, Semiti Institution for Art and Society, um, Gary Lo Lo Long. And this year with my EM Contemporary Art Museum with um, a curator at, and also um, thanks to so much for the hosting us for the symposium today, the last scenario. And before, before we end, I would like to share a bit on the tomorrow panel, which is the last day, sadly, of the symposium of the gatherer. It will come on the topic of extinction, the impact of humans on our non-human world, which will be featured the speaker, Napak Serilak Tita Sarina, the first curriculum, and will be responded by Vipa Purishyanon. And it will start at the same time as today at 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. And it's already been 5 p.m. today. And I would like to thank you so much for uh, um, being together with us today and hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all everyone. Thank you, Akung. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you.